Hey, I just read this really interesting interview um, that in 1961. Of course, the 1960s were such an amazing time in the U.S. because you had this clash of ideas of, of culture. And this in this interview, uh, well, this interview was done by Paul Krasner, K-R-A-S-S-N-E-R, -S -S and he was a Brooklyn-born uh, Jew. He was interviewing uh, the founder of the American Nazi Party, whose name I can't remember, uh, in 1961. Uh, the party was founded in 1958. Now, within that interview, uh, they both agree that Hitler was born, was Catholic born. And because the Holy See, once it lost power, you know, in, in Rome, it eventually actually went to the Saxony regrouped in Europe in what, what's now considered Germany's Saxony area, which includes today uh, some of the most right-wing political parties within the entire country in Germany, including AFD. Uh, and when we say right-wing in the German context, basically what we're saying is we want things to stay the, stay the same. Uh, we don't want more immigration. We don't want the euro. You know, we, we just want things to stay the same. And within the context of, you know, it, it, it's going to start making more sense about why that would be the case. Now, what's, what I think is, is an impediment to world peace is, at this point, the failure of so many private Catholic institutions in revealing their own history and properly analyzing their own history. And indeed, it could be the case that anyone who properly studies world history would necessarily become disgusted by the actions of the Catholic Church. That's not to say that there were not outstanding Catholic individuals. The problem is that those individuals were small, few in number and are, and are being used now by the Catholic Church's media arms, of which are many, the Catholic Radio, um, you know, you have, in many cases, a Holy See appointee or a bishop uh, that works with governments in most of the world to represent Catholic interests. Not Italian interests, Catholic Vatican interests. And, I mean, one of those examples, of course, is Juan Palafox, who, has, who founded one of the public libraries in Mexico. Um, and if, but if you go now, and Quincy Jones Jr., said the same thing. He said, whenever you go to South America, you know, when you go down to the Zocalo, the central square, uh, there's always a Catholic church. And the economy is centered around that Catholic church. Um, and this actually takes you back to Mexican history, uh, where one of the uh, generals actually united the country uh, by returning property to the Catholic church that had been seized before him. Um, I don't remember his name. Is it Portfolio? I don't remember his name offhand. So you can actually see world history as a sort of battle between this sort of phenomenon where the Catholic Church comes in, establishes power, takes funding away from the government in order to fund its own privatized social services, and eventually weakens the government to the point where the government then has to seize the property of the Catholic Church in order to become relevant again. Especially with, you know, and, and of course the influence one of the reasons that's, that's a, it's a problem is because, first of all, ask yourself, how do governments establish credibility? In most places, it's hospitals, schools. And, I mean, you can have the military as well, um, but if you don't have the hospitals and the schools, you don't really have a functioning, I mean, you just simply have an exploitative country. Uh, so you have to have the, the hospitals and the schools. And, you know, of course, those are nonprofit, they're not taxed. You have to have some sort of center for in intellectual delivery. And what is astounding um, is, first of all, how few people are talking about this, um, especially because, you know, people, you know, when you are so interested in the JFK assassination, um, and it was quite obvious that, you know, his brother, uh, Robert Kennedy, was investigating the mob and possibly connections with the Catholic Church within that Italian mob. Um, you can actually study, you can go back in American history, and there's, there's one of the reasons you had so much anti-antipathy towards immigration was because of the, well, we know it's Italians and Irish that were particularly, particularly singled out. Well, it turned, you know, now those were mainly Catholics. And what, that's what's so, and, and they were coming into a country that at the time was, in many places, uh, was were Protestant. 
And of course, you know, they came there because the Catholic Church kicked them out of Europe initially. And that was, that's what led to the Protestant Reformation. The word Protestant means to protest the Catholic Church's misdeeds and corruption. Now, the problem is that when Martin, Lu Martin Luther, it wasn't just him, he was the one that was successful in Germany, which number one tells you something really off when, the, when of all places, the, you know, the Catholic Church then ends up establishing a center of influence back in Germany, uh, the birthplace of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, but it also goes, shows you how powerful the Catholic Church is. Now, um, the, and part of that is because it's a centralized structure. So if you take out, and it's, the reason centralized structures typically work over the long term for survival, but not necessarily creativity or justice, because if you take out one of the satellites that's connected to the central organization, you can still survive. Whereas if you're like Islam and you just have, you know, multiple sects or not necessarily multiple sects, but no central authority that issues a decree, you have the, the familiar problem of fragments, fragmentation, without a consistent method to resolve those disputes. In other words, you're, you're stuck being local. You will never be in, in a position where, you know, you're able to consistently have some sort of philosophy like a papal decree or a papal bull uh, that allows you to merge or, you know, all these different ideologies, all these different interpretations worldwide. Um, but it's, and, and what's astounding again is just how, how difficult it is for people within the, the United States to figure these things out. And it's particularly astounding because the Catholic Church, if you want to single out a single corrupt entity worldwide in world history, it would be the Catholic Church. And let me just kind of count the ways. Um, the Crusades, that was ordered by Pope Urban II to go in. And when the Catholics led armies, that's why you have the Crusaders with a cross um, on their shields. And everyone's seen those images. Well, what happened was they went in there and they, they succeeded at that point, um, and they killed all the women and children. Uh, when Saladin, who also took Jerusalem, uh, succeeded, he did not kill the women and children. So Islam has always been more temperate. It reformed slavery from a thousand years before the Catholic Church did. Uh, and in fact, we know that because the centralization of the Catholic Church is also its undoing, because there's so much evidence, uh, you know, that they've kept. And in this case, you can look up dumb diversus, um, and that's a papal bull that authorizes slavery, and not, it goes, actually goes way beyond that. And that was released, I believe, in the 1500s. So you've got a situation where, you know, the Catholic Church in the 1500s is essentially allowing its, all of its satellites to engage in slavery. And that's one of the reasons why slavery in the Western Hemisphere uh, was so pernicious. It changed from indentured servitude into chattel slavery. And that's partly, because, actually in, in large part, because of Catholic Spain and Catholic Portugal which were going out to Mexico, stealing all the silver and bringing it back in order to maintain the House of Bourbon. Um, and that went all the way up until, of course, Martin Luther. And then, of course, the French Revolution, which it was, in fact, an anti-Catholic, as well as just an, it was an anti-religious revolution. Uh, it was an anti, you know, it was something against hierarchy, it was against authority. And, of course, at the time, who was the authority? It was a Catholic church. Uh, one of the famous philosophers, Diderot, once said, at the time, no, right around the time, he said that mankind will never be free until the last king is strangled with the entrails of the last Catholic priest. He said priest, but of course it's Catholic, it's not Protestant. You can also look at the economies, and this is, this is where I, it gets a little bit speculative, that right now the worst performing economies in Europe would be uh, places that uh, did not reform, uh, in other words, did not try to resist Catholicism authority. Uh, that would be Italy, of course. We're one of the worst performing. It's essentially a mafia state at this point. Um, if thirty percent, thirty percent of the stock market, perhaps more, is owned by the Catholic Church. Sicily is, I mean, it's not a place you would want to live. The uh, at one point the mafia had essentially controlled almost all the property, the construction, and everything else. Now, why is that relevant? Because the Gambino family was shipping weapons and drugs from Sicily into New York. So there's always been, remember I was talking about JFK, he was never supposed to actually prosecute the mafia. He was supposed to sort of, and, and this isn't something that you can, you can go back and look at this, right? Because JFK's father was some, somebody who profited off of prohibition. 
Uh, he was doing bootleg, you know, he was bootlegging liquor. So, you know, you've got this, uh, you already at that time have, you know, a sort of anti antipathy towards authority, but in a criminal sense. And so this is why, one of the reasons why I think it was quite unex unexpected for JFK's team to actually go in and try to reform the connections that got him into place. But anyway, um, what, what I think is you want to go back, you look at the Crusades, but you can, and this goes from all the way from, you know, 1000, the year 1000 or 1100, all the way up into the Vietnam War. The United States, uh, by the way, you can understand all this, right? I was talking about Spain and Italy. Well, the, the economies are doing terribly because they were the ones that relied on slaves for the longest. The Protestants, you talk about the Protestant work ethic. Well, one of the reasons that they, when they kicked out the Catholics, they had to work themselves. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that Martin Luther was anti-Semitic. He hated Jews. So you know, it wasn't as if there was any sort of, sort of you know, um, paradise for any minority, really, in Europe for quite some time. Um, and of, part of that is not just religion, it's just borders. Everyone wants to expand, to take land. One of the reasons Hitler uh, won, actually, he went into Austria first. Austria had oil, but it was also easy because there was no resistance because it was the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, which then had connections to Germany at the time. Uh, so they spoke German. Um, but, you know, what I'm trying to say is that, this, that all of this becomes a lot of the modern history because of the vast influence of the Catholic Church becomes more understandable to you, including the underperformance of certain countries in Europe that, you know, because of the Catholic Church, were able to use chattel slavery for longer than the northern counterparts. And everyone wants to talk about how the north is, I mean, they all have these other th sort of theories or hypotheses, but they don't seem to sort of connect it with you know, the, the slave aspect, where, you know, if you have one country or one uh, area that's more dependent on slaves than another, um, I mean, of course, there's going to be differences over a long period of time, especially hundreds of years, right? The um, Martin Luther came out, succeeded around 1500. Well, sorry, 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 sorry. Is that true? Um, it was about 200 years, so I, it was, it was might have been earlier. I, might, I, might, I maybe have those dates wrong. We, we want to look up the Martin Luther, and then you want to look up um, the, you know, the start of the Protestant Reformation, which of course didn't happen just with him. It was Jan Hus in Czech, uh, in the Czech area, uh, that actually, and it could have been far be, you know, in, in Martin Luther, you know, even though they spoke, spoke different languages, they were complaining about the same things, which again goes back to the consistency within centralization, which can be good or bad. But in this case, mostly bad when you consider history. Uh, not just slavery, but a lot of other things. A con con concentration of power that tends to weaken governments. So now, think about any I'm jumping around, but think about any, any Catholic dom dominant, no, Catholic country with mo mo mainly Catholics. You've got Philippines, poor country. Poland's propped up by United States military funding. Um, and, you know, you've, it, because it's next to Russia. And it's always been, it's got a lot of land, so it's always been that, that barrier uh, to so-called Russian intrusion. Uh, you go back and look at the heart, South America, almost all of it is, is, is except for Chile, uh, is, is not succeeding as well as countries in Asia, which do not have similar centralization structures um, outside of China. Now, you know, um, you know, of course, it's not the only reason, right? But let's just continue. We've got the Crusades all the way up to uh, 1900s, where you've got the Vietnam War, the, uh, the, and a lot of the anti-communist efforts were led by Catholic Joe McCarthy. Um, and one of the reasons was not just, you know, this, this conflation that white supremacists make between communists and Jews, uh, it was also to prevent a, a intrusion into the Catholic spheres of, of political influence. And this didn't just happen in, you know, Catholic countries, right? It, it happened all over the world, although it's happened in Singapore, um, where they weeded out in, in Indonesia. But what, the, what all those places have in common? American influence, right? Suharto was essentially funded at, at various points in time in Indonesia by the United States. Um, and of course, they went on that. That allowed an anti-communist purge. Singapore was, of course, propped. You know, it's, it's today. I think the United States has more money in this country than in all of China. And Singapore is a tiny place. You can drive across the whole country in a couple of hours, maybe even less. Um, so, you know, you, you go back and look at all these different things. So you've got Joseph McCarthy, which then, you know, and the government at that point then is convinced, because of the Catholic influence, to install the M in South Vietnam. Um, and Diem is a dictator, immediately begins discrimination against Buddhists, which then leads on, which then leads to this, you know, the famous image of the priest who is self-immolating himself, setting himself on fire, 
that was because of the dictator that was installed by, you know, and the discrimination of the United States uh, in an anti-communist effort in Vietnam. Diem's brother, who was helping run day-to-day -day operations in South Vietnam, was an archbishop. There's literally, I, I can't think of anybody, any other entity that's, well, you can go back and look at that. Now, that's not the only problem. Um, who made a deal with Hitler? The Catholic Church made a deal with Hitler in order to protect its property. That treaty, Concordat, um, a lot of weird names, Papal Bull, Concordat, and of course that's because you're sort of translating German words uh, into English and so on. Um, and ultimately, you've got or, uh, a situation where that treaty gave the Nazis, uh, the National Socialists, power, uh, respect. If you can make a deal with the Catholic Church, interesting, that gives you respectability. Uh, it's, that, that's the rationale behind why so many you don't you know, don't want to give people certain people a platform and and, and, a, and appear in that for them, um, and, and you know even when you do, you want to make it obvious that you're not approving of you know having to be there. So the the example of that would be Bill Clinton going over to North Korea to help release prisoners, uh, and the famous picture of him, you know, in, in a photo, but not smiling, and it's, that sends a, 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 quite a big message, of course, um, and so. You look at that. You've got no other entity that's that's you know that's been able to voluntarily attract followers that has covered up child molestation intentionally. You can look at the movie, the documentary, uh, "Deliver Us from Evil." Uh, there's another movie by the same name. That's not it. We want to look at the documentary that that includes depositions. Uh, you've got nobody else that has. You know, think of anybody else that, that would have done all these different things. They'd be bankrupt. Um, or they just wouldn't be able to use their media influence in order to prevent, you know, an audit that would probably end up you know, creating some major problems. The billion dollar judgment, you know, it's hard to enforce because despite the centralization of the Catholic Church, I mean, literally you can't open up a Catholic Church unless you agree to papal suprem supremacy, which means that the Pope and, is, and the Holy See is, is your authority. Uh, there is even a papal decree about that. Uh, canon number 213, I don't remember the exact one. Um, but uh, in any case, even though you have a centralized structure that clearly is a central structure, which would allow you to go back and get the assets of the church in Rome, you can't do that. In the Vatican, sorry, not Rome, Vatican. You can't do that because the legal structures, uh, the laws, which are in part, you know, drafted by Catholics, Italian Catholics um, or Irish Catholics, um, you know, prevent that from happening under a legal fiction that claims that, well, these little outposts of the Catholic Church even though they accept papal supremacy, you know, they're really independent. Okay, fine. You can't get the assets of everybody in this central, centralized organization that's set up to be a centralized organization that answers for the Pope. You can only get the assets of this little diocese all the way down there, which probably has very little except the building that they bought in 1950 or 1900. Now, um, so you've got that, the child molestation intention, intentional cover-up, which led to a billion dollar judgment. You've got uh, just the, again, just the consistent pattern of trying to supplant governments in the areas of education and hospitals in order to weaken governments um, and, and essentially uh, create political power through religious debate and religious choices like issues like abortion and so on. Uh, within the United States, Joe Biden, Catholic, um, in my city of San Jose, the city council at, at one point a few years ago, uh, both of the ma mayor candidates went to the same Catholic high school, the same high school. You can't even get any sort of, you can't, you can't lose at this point, right? Um, city council, which almost all of them went to, uh, again, this is the 10th largest city in America, by the way. It's not some little podunk town. Uh, it's about an hour south of San Francisco. Police chief went to a private Catholic high school. His last name is Garcia, but he's white. It tells you again that you're dealing with what you know, and this may be an inflammatory statement, but, um, you know, Catholics are most, for the most part, right, all the popes are white, with a, you know, a centralized organ organization. Um, if you look at, you know, one of the reasons that, um, you know, you go to, say, South America, you see a lot of white colored people in Mexico, uh, and especially in, in the center of government. That's because Spain, they came from Catholic Spain down there. Um, and so, they're, and they're all, they're white, you know, as, as, you know just like me. Uh, um, and again, that, that tells you what's, what's happening, right? They supplant the local institutions. Diego Rivera has a lot of, you want to look at his paintings, and which are beautiful just in, in and of themselves, but a lot, of, a lot of them display what the Catholics did when they came to the, when they encountered 
the indigenous, the indigenous people. It's, that's not, not the only place it happened. You go back and look at, say, Catholics and Magellan going over to the Philippines, went over to Mactan Islands, and natives killed them. Um, that, of course, caused one of the reasons, right, when that happens, the central organization then sends in twice as many people to take over that place, and usually they succeed because, you know, that happens in, in Mexico at one point. You know, history is amazing. Um, it was at Zaragoza uh, in Puebla, my favorite place, one of my one of the best places to see in Mexico. He defeated the, one of the French uh, um, commanders. Uh, so that that's, I think, the basis of Cinco de Mayo. Uh, anyway, it's a problem, right, because the, the, they came back. Um, so it's a very consistent pattern within European you know, colonial behavior. If you manage to win one war, we'll just keep coming at you because we have these central resources, centralized resources. Um, it also explains, by the way, why Islam has, has not been as successful as Catholicism because of the lack of centralization, but which also explains why Islam is so much more diverse. Um, you know, you, not only because it banned slavery uh, or chattel slavery from, an, almost from you know, inception, that was literally the core of why the Prophet Muhammad was chased out of his, his place of birth, uh, because he refused to let the elites, he was from the same tribe as the elites, but he was an orphan. Um, and so, you know, he was not, in, you know, absolutely against slavery and the way that the pre-Islamic Arab tribes were practicing it. So anyway, that's what led them to, to try to kill him so, you know, numerous times. And that actually was also able to, you know, also why Islam was so effective is because, you know, they were going up against this elitist class structure um, and being led by an orphan who just didn't believe in any of that, uh, who also married somebody who was a successful businesswoman, much older than him. Uh, she had the influence of a woman who is already a social nonconformist because she's marrying somebody younger who's not, even though he's from a tr the same tribe as the elitists, um, is not himself affluent in any way. She marries him because she thinks he's honest uh, or a good man. Uh, anyway, so you have this sort of nonconformist sort of situation that then is one of the reasons why when you go to Northern Africa, well, why does Africa have so many different colors? Africa is not homogenous like the United States. In the United States, you've got black and white. Uh, of course, some, some Asians are, as well. Hawaii is, of course, different. Um, but you go to Africa, it's even just the North, right? Don't forget about, I mean, it's, Africa has the most colors in the world. And, 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 you know, one of the reasons is because of Islam. You don't wipe out everybody when you coach, when you show up. You try to integrate them into your army um, if you can. And so Northern Africa, and of course, when the British showed up, they called these people swarthy in a very derogatory way. Uh, but that's because the Muslims at that time did not practice segregation. They couldn't. That was the core. I mean, uh, just look at the story of Bilal, B-I-L-A-L. -L. Anyway, um, so you've got that. You've got the, let's see what we've covered. The corruption in terms of the mafia links, the Gambino family, Sicily, uh, child molestation, deals with Hitler, support for wars that, for the most part, disregard civilian deaths, crusades, Vietnam, um, there's, you know, there's really no other entity that would be able to survive with all these different historical um, issues. And yet, you know, because of the fact that so much of that political control uh, it allows people access to media power as well, um, you've got a situation where most people who are Catholic, born Catholic, or who attend Catholic schools will never really understand history at all. Um, because you now that doesn't mean, well, first of all, they will be taught, you know, all the good things about their own, their own religion, because there are quite a few Catholic priests that were, um, that did oppose the Hitler, uh, and were sent, uh, to, to, to prison camps, uh, many of them. Uh, but again, these are a minority within the Catholic church. This is not something that happened. And then to be fair, most, you know, almost everyone who at, at some point is living under a, an oppressive regime. At some point, almost all the protesters are, are in fact minorities, uh, if, if not, you know, in terms of religion, uh, racially. And it's important to also note that uh, Germany at the time, because of, again, Martin Luther, right? So it's a Protestant country. Uh, so it's only, it's about 30% Roman Catholic, 70% Protestant. Uh, but it's still, because again, the, the regrouping happens um, in Germany out after Rome. So you have like what's called the new, the new Holy em Roman Empire. Um, and, and, you know, they ended up going back because, you know, you, you probably had a situation where Martin Luther just wasn't very effective. And the Protestants, pro you know, probably didn't kick out, you know, the, the Catholics. I think you know, it's, it seems like it would have to be that way. Uh, whereas the Catholics, anywhere in Europe, when they would take over and get the ear of the king, 
the first thing that would happen is anybody, not just the Jews, that were that was not Catholic would be kicked out. To this day, if you want to have original transcripts of Protest, important Protestant works, a lot of them are, in fact, under the, the uh, uh, jurisdiction of the Catholic Church because it was able to kick out uh, so many people that were, simply were not Catholic. Um, so you've, you have a situation where world history can be explained uh, simply by, through the prism, at least uh, European history can, and American history, um, you know, can be explained through the prism of the Catholic Church's misdeeds. You also see why fake news is so prevalent. If you can cover up that much stuff and still survive, why wouldn't you have fake news and disinf disinformation everywhere else? Um, and, and, you know, you've got this whole situation where you, you can also go back and look at, you know, just immigration issues back then. Um, I mean, everything can be looked at in, in, the, in the U.S., the Supreme Court, by the way, majority Catholic um, for almost, you know, the last 50 years, um, or at least four, at least four, um, you know, usually five. Of course, you've got your Scalia, most famous one. Um, you know, you just, just go back and look. Uh, Kennedy, um, you know, An Antonin. So you've got a situation there where, you know, the real question is how are we going to have world peace without trying to make the same mistakes that have happened in the past. And I think the most obvious answer is reformation within, from within of the Catholic Church, because you simply, because of threats to our, everyone's safety, um, in, in other words, allowing the operation of, you know, sort of extrajudicial, extra legal economic activities is now much more dangerous. Uh, the weapons are more, you know, dangerous. So if, you know, it may have been that you know, you might have been able to have a criminal working with the FBI in the U.S., I think his name is Whitey Bulger, um, shipping weapons to, you know, to Ireland to help the IRA. Um, you know, now if you try to do, this, do the same thing, maybe somebody puts in a nuclear suitcase uh, or a drone that's capable of causing much more damage than a, than a few machine guns or grenades uh, or car bombs. So uh, is, you know, the question really is, if you want to reform which is what JFK tried to do, or really RFK, his brother, you have to figure out how to do it. And it's going to be more difficult if it's, if it's oppositional. And so we really need to see reform from within the Catholic Church. Unfortunately, Biden is never going to talk about this. I don't think he's going to, and he's not going to be the one to do it, um, most likely. Um, he, if, you look at his, if you look at his voting record, I mean, he, he voted for the Iraq invasion. Um, he was ran for president in 1988. Uh, stopped running because he uh, alleged, well, it was plagiarism, but it was it was actually, of all the things he's lied about, uh, that was one of the smaller ones. And I don't claim that any politician, Catholic or non-Catholic, is going to be honest. Politicians, for the most, just people that want to be politicians, or in general, people that want to be in the limelight, um, are almost always storytellers. Um, and that, that leaves them open to lying. Uh, so that's not, I, I think Joe Biden is actually a good man. Uh, but is he going to be, you know, it's not necessarily smart enough, but is he going to be adept enough to be able to navigate these issues uh, like RFK tried to do? I don't think so at all. Um, and so you've got a, a situation there uh, where now you're once again stuck in the year 2020 uh, with choosing between the lesser of two evils. Um, so the, the real question is, how do we get out of this, this rut? One of them would be clearly internal reform within the Catholic Church, led by Pope Francis. I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't know if it's happening. If it does happen, it would have to be a global effort. You can't just wipe them out and you know, try to figure out you know, where all the safety deposit boxes are in New York that are connected with the Gambino family that then lead back to you know, some other sort of stock market holdings. In order to, you, know, you can't actually do that because the corporations are now you know, legally non-transparent. They have so many subsidiaries and this isn't, you know, that, that this isn't just an issue within the Catholic Church's, you know, alleged links to the mob. It's everywhere. Uh, this is one of the reasons why also governments have become weaker because they're not able to tax people properly or entities properly. In some cases, the inability to tax is legitimate. Like Amazon reinvests that money and lowers prices for everybody on essential items and non-essential items. They just now, they just now offered a discount uh, for Prime membership, which which gives you one day delivery for free, 
uh, they just now extended a discount, I think it's half off, to anybody with a, an EBT card. And in other words, anybody who's on social welfare. So this is a good thing. Now you have other companies, now the other example of course is if you have a situation where a lot of that, and by the way, it's creating supply chains that it can control itself and therefore would not be subject to the whims of a port authority uh, or you know the whims of a union, a dock workers union that may have connections to the Catholic church um, or some other major entity or a corporation or, or somebody that's loyal, it's not necessarily to free trade or commerce, but just to some political entity. Um, in New York, at one point, the Parks Commissioner, was his name Moses, was one of the most powerful political figures in the entire, in, in New York City, because if you want to ex expand, you have to, you can't, you have to go, sometimes you may have, may have had to raise a park, and so you could make, you know, that one commissioner, you know, you wouldn't think of that person as being more powerful than a mayor, but if you can prevent development, then that makes you more powerful than a mayor. Um, and by the way, that's why a lot of people focus on environmentalism, because it, it's something that, it's a legal mechanism to prevent too, too many shopping malls. So people say, well, uh, you know, and, and in order to weaken that that movement, people are now focusing on like things like plastics and, you know, disposable plastics, which is legitimate, but really the power of that environmental movement is to prevent um, just ex an, an excessive amount of development worldwide. Um, because if you build a mall in one place and it works, you typically take that same structure and build it someplace else. Um, and in some cases, you know, you have soil that's different. You have hard water versus soft water. You may not have enough steel. Enough steel. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why some buildings collapse, right? And one of the reasons why, um, you know, like I said, if you're trying to cut corners like the mafia does when they deal with, try to launder money in cement companies or, or construction companies, you know, you have a lot of problems overall, in, in overall integrity. Um, so all of this has to be resolved either by internal the point here is, you know, change from within the Catholic Church, led by Pope Francis working with international regulators to stop the money laundering. Um, and, to, and you know, the other way would be that we have a change of, of, of heart, right? We figure out that it's not a good idea to let a private entity that is that with these kinds of historical um, lapses in morality to have so much political power. And we end up taxing all religious institutions property in the, well, in, in the United States. Um, is that going to happen? I'm not the first person who said this. Many people have said this. Uh, the reason it's not happening is because, again, that would impact the power of the status quo, which is all the more reason to do it. Um, now, and, you know, your Catholic Church has managed to make all these taxation arguments about, you know, freedom of, of religion, which is, you know, the way that they've managed to avoid it. Um, but really, we're talking about, at this point, the integrity of the government itself. Uh, you know, in order to be able to compete. Now, Germany, by the way, a lot of their services, social services, and Germany is a well-run country, now, as you know, also go through the Catholic Church. So you can see what happens. Anywhere the Catholic Church goes, they divert that tax revenue into their own employment structures, which are based oftentimes on nepotism. In other words, a country club exclusion atmosphere, which they then try to, you know, they then try to emphasize outliers like the dissident priests that were jailed, uh, libraries, and so on. Um, but you have to sort of see beyond that uh, to see what's really going on. So you've got the taxation, you've got internal reform with global authorities, especially tax authorities. Uh, and if, if, if one and two don't work, there's a possibility that you may just have to carve out, you know, places in, in the world that are, you may become, you have to become nationalistic, which is, what, which is what's exactly what's happening now, right? People are closing their borders. You don't really have free trade. You know, China, of course, refuses, does not allow the Catholic Church to have, people think it's an anti-Christian thing, it's not. It's an anti-Catholic Church thing. Um, and, one, and, you know, the Communist Party wants to remain unchallenged, uh, but in this case, justifiably so, uh, given the track record of the Catholic Church uh, in Asia, uh, in Vietnam especially. So you have uh, all these different things coming together. Are, are we gonna resolve these things? And if we don't, we may not have the kind of globalization that is that really does uphold the individual or free trade. We have a long way ahead of us, but the first path that we have to take is the one that's based on truth, whether or not it conflicts with the ideologies or the news of the status quo.